want to thank everybody for coming to this uh, Rolls Better Engineering webinar. Basically, it's a Q&A session. Uh, I've got a couple things to talk about, um, uh, just in case we don't have time. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about, uh, oops, what is going on here? First thing we're going to talk about is we are going to talk about um, how these things work. Uh, looks like, there we go. So a couple of housekeeping items, try to keep this to 60 minutes, but if we get more questions, uh, then uh, we'll go ahead and continue on and answer the questions. So that's no big deal. Um, Got to wait for my slide to catch up. Looks like it's a little delayed. Uh, come on, wake up. Anyways, uh, there we go. So just some general housekeeping items, try to keep the 60 minutes. You should have a panel that looks like this on your screen. Uh, a couple ways to get a hold of me. Uh, the first thing is, is that uh, you want to use uh, your audio. You want your audio to be through one source, either by calling on a cell phone to the number to the to the phone number. This may not be the number that you're that you're seeing, but uh, you're going to want to use that number. Um, let's see here. So this number is probably not the number that you see, but you're going to want to use that dial-in number to make sure that you call that number and use the access code or that you're using just wholly your computer audio. Um, if you have both of them and I enable your microphone, what can happen is you'll get a lot of feedback and it'll blow everybody's eardrums out. Um, uh, next thing is, um, again, we've, we've muted the microphones because we don't have want to have the audio feedback. Uh, if you have a question, uh, the best way to do it uh, is to go into your 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 question pane and type it into there. Um, last time we did this, we opened up the mics to a few people, and of course, we had all that feedback, and it wasn't pretty. So, uh, if you if you have to answer the question verbally, that's fine. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, and and open those up, and we'll see how it goes. If we get if we get feedback, we're going to have to have uh, written questions. Um, all right, so the the question I got this morning from from a customer um, was addressing trying to recover a battery bank, uh, a, a discharged or or, or or even a abused battery bank. So you want to be with discharged or abused battery banks. It can take time to recover them. Um, just to give you an idea, from a, a 1.220 specific gravity. Oops, wrong slide. Uh, from just a 1.22 specific gravity um, or 1.220 specific gravity, it can take six to eight weeks of daily charging to get those batteries to cover. And you've, you've got to look at the specific gravities uh, or the overall health of the battery bank. Without looking at the specific gravities, uh, you're, you're pretty much blind is what you're trying to take care of and what you're trying to do. I mean, most battery reports often look like look like this. Basically, what you get is you get specific gravities, you know, uh, 0 0.228, 0 0.240, 0 0.250, 267, uh, and likewise. Basically, you get specific gravities that are kind of all over the place. You know, they're not. There's there's there can be cases where you see. Let's see here. In the cases where you see them all relatively close. But they are, uh, you know, the you know, like like for example, this one here that's all relatively close. All the specific gravities relatively close. The batteries are basically just being undercharged here. Okay. Um, so what you want to do is when you're when you're troubleshooting something like this, what you want to do. So we'll go back to this this other one that I have. Uh, 1228, 1240, 1250. 1215, 1267, 1250, and likewise, okay? Um, basically, they're, ex they're exhibiting signs of severe, of severe sulfation, okay? Uh, there's a, there, there is a greater than 35 point difference between some of the cells, um, but, be, but the first thing I wouldn't do is do an equalization. The first thing I would do is adjust your charging voltages. More than likely what caused this are your charging voltages and or your absorption times, or you have an end amp setting that is programmed on the charge controller or the inverter or whatever charger you're using, um, there's something wrong with the setting, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna go into your settings and verify your settings 
raise your bulk and absorption voltages by two tenths or four tenths of a volt, add 60 to 120 minutes to your absorption time, defend your eight end amps or return amps or tail current settings. And this is the most important thing right here. Wait three to four weeks, okay? Let it charge, let it run, and wait three to four weeks. It can take two, three, four weeks for charge settings to really start coming into effect. Basically, what you've done is you you just you undercharge the battery bank for such a such a long period of time that the batteries have sulfated. That sulfation doesn't come off the first time you do an equalization or the first time you charge those batteries, especially if it's been hardened. Okay, it's much like. We've all sat around the house for this COVID-19 situation or sat around the office or uh, a lot of people, have, uh, you know, have been working from home and the refrigerator is only, you know, 30 steps away and you just keep looking in it. And so that weight's not going to come off the first time we go out and run, the first time we go to the gym. It's going to come off when you go to the gym four days a week, five days a week for an hour at a time and when you start eating better. And it's the same thing with batteries. When you go and you you sulfate your batteries and because they've been abused or undercharged or over discharged, it takes time to recover those batteries. It's not magic. It doesn't happen overnight. And so let's say you waited two, three weeks. Okay. Now you're getting this. You get 1.248, you get 1.250, uh, uh, 1.260, 1.235, 1.277. And so you've seen marked improvement pretty much across the entire range of batteries. So now your customer, you are charging those batteries closer to where they want to be. The only thing that you have here that's a little odd is cell number four is still struggling behind the entire battery bank, okay? So what you could try here is you could try a short one to three hour equalization at 2.6 volts per cell or 31.2 volts. Um, you could try that. I would try that once. Uh, you know, after a full absorption charge, you start your equalization, run it for one to three hours, let it rest, check your specific gravities the next day. If they're still the same way, you give it a week or two, and then you can try it again. Don't just continually hit the battery bank with a hard equalization every day or, or equalization. I get customers that call up and say, Steve, I equalized my battery bank six times in the last three days and it still hasn't recovered. Well, it's probably not going to and you're, you're actually causing more damage to the batteries than you are helping. So you, you, you have to be patient when you're doing this troubleshooting. If you ended up with something like this, uh, where you see a little bit of improvement uh, in some cells, but you don't see improvement across the rest, then there's a good chance that this battery bank was sitting too long and probably will eventually fail. It's probably not recoverable. So you want to be careful with that. Um, if you have a specific gravity report like this, where you've got uh, 1180, 1190, 1185, 1200, 1175, you know, same thing. You've got to get more aggressive. You've got to get more aggressive on your settings, but there's a good chance that if the battery sat like this for a very long experience, ex extended period of time, that you're not going to be able to recover it. So uh, you want to be very careful with that. Okay, looks like you got a couple questions. I'm going to pop back to the my other screens here. Hopefully that answered some of the questions. It's not uh, an easy question to answer. So um, uh, uh what you want to do is if you if you if you have more questions on that, you can contact me directly or uh, we do have an advanced troubleshooting PowerPoint on YouTube uh, that we go that we've gone over the advanced troubleshooting and talks about how to read those specific gravities, how to understand them and and where to go with them. Um, first question, uh, I have clients looking for a backup freezer, et cetera, too expensive to do the whole farm. They just want certain breakers backed up. What type of BMS do you have with the batteries for auto switching, et cetera? Uh, thanks for the question, Vern. Um, uh, the, typically what you do, if you're just looking for a backup application, what you do is you size the system. You size the system according to that backup. So when you size and design the system, I'm assuming the system is, uh, uh, currently uh, installed 
Uh, if it's not currently installed, that's even better. But uh, what you do is you size the system for those backups. So you look at how much load is on that backup panel. You'll wire your, the output of your inverter to load, to, to, to run off that panel. The input of the inverter goes to your, your generator or your utility source, so it always, it always keeps the batteries fully charged. Um, as for a BMS, typically you don't use lead B, BMSs for lead batteries. You don't need it. Lead batteries are not going to catch fire like lithium batteries will, okay? If you put a lithium battery into a system without a battery management system, without monitoring cell voltage, cell temperature, uh, you know, on every single cell in the lithium battery pack, and there could be, you know, hundreds of thousands, depending on how big the lithium battery pack can be, if you're not monitoring each and every single cell for that voltage and temperature, you, your chances of thermal runaway exponentially increase. So the lead-based lead batteries, the only problem that you can get with lead-based batteries that's bad is you, can go, you could get a hydrogen ignition, and hydrogen ignitions are caused by loose connections, sparking, uh, you know, or you know, my favorite is when you put the battery bank in, you put the inverters right above the battery bank. Well, that hydrogen sulfide gas is lighter than air, so it rises right into the inverters, corrodes the inverters, and when the inverter relay switches back and forth, it sparks and could ignite the hydrogen. Um, so typically, I wouldn't suggest a BMS for lead-based batteries. Uh, so what you, what you have to do, Vern, is, is you have to install, typically what people do is they install a 60-amp sub-panel. They wire those backed-up loads into that sub-panel. And then the, the source for that sub panel is the output of your inverter inverter charger. And then, of course, the input of the inverter charger connects over to the main panel so that when utility drops, that, that secondary sub panel is powered by the inverter because the inverter sees the dropout, powers up, and runs the loads. Um, Okay, so Julian DeMarte De asked a couple questions. Uh, so he has a client that was using a Series 4500 level indica indicator on a Series 5000 battery. Um, he's gotten them the correct level indicators, but uh, will that have caused any issues? Um, yes, if it's not the correct level indicator for the correct battery, you could either overfill the batteries or you could underfill the batteries. Of course, underfilling the batteries will cause will cause problems with uh, uh, exposing the battery plates to to corrosion. And so what that looks like is this here, is when you underfill a battery, um, got to wait for my computer to, or my internet connection to catch up, uh, as soon as it catches up. So what ends up happening is, is that the, you expose the plates to, to, you expose the plates to air, and that air causes corrosion. And that corrosion is going to cause problems with the, with the, with the battery bank in general. So this is what this looks like. And so it almost looks like a flood line of a house. And so you can see the line right here on the battery plate. So you see the line of the battery plate where the water level was. And then this is the top of the plate up here. And that top of the plate, you can tell that all this is actual corrosion. And that corrosion is gonna cause problems with the battery in general, you're gonna lose. So this customer has lost half his capacity. Um, now, overfilling, what overfilling does is um, overfilling when you, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you, when you uh, fill a battery, basically the battery, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to a blank screen here so I can draw this and hopefully it doesn't look too bad. Um, but when you overfill a battery, you're actually gonna cause electrolyte to push out of the battery bank. And what that will do is, let's see here. What that will do is that will, uh, there we go, there's a white screen. So what that will do is that will cause the electrolyte to push out of the battery, okay? So what we have here, oops. Sorry, gotta love these technical difficulties. So I'm trying to draw, there we go. So what we have here, again, pardon my chicken scratch. So we have a battery. Okay, here's our positive, here's our negative, and then let's say this is a, uh, a six volt battery. Lots of people like the six volt batteries. And so this is what they basically what it looks like. Now, 
not the best drawing in the world, but that is what's called the vent well, okay? The vent well on the Series 5000 batteries extends about an inch into the battery bank, okay? About an inch into the battery cell itself. So let's say this is the vent well. Let's just talk about this one here, so it's better drawing. The, the water level should never come closer than, so this is the water level, one quarter inch to one half inch from the bottom of the fill tube. There goes, there's my chicken scratch. It's pretty bad writing on a screen. So, so what happens is, yeah, sorry, Mark, it's a little delayed. Um, gotta love the internet drawing. So the, the, what happens is, is that the water level should not come any closer than that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop and find a actual better drawing that's in our manual. Uh, believe it or not, it's actually in our manual. Um, so you don't want to under or overfill the battery. If you overfill the battery, you actually push out electrolyte out of the battery. And that electrolyte, when it pushes out, there we go, there's even a better drawing. So that electrolyte, and it's going to catch up. It's going to take a couple seconds for the uh, for that for that drawing to populate. There we go. And so what's going to happen here is is if you overfill, if the water level is up in this area, okay, then what happens is is when you charge that battery, that water expands, and when that water expands, it'll push out because those tops aren't sealed, it'll push out. And so if you take a voltmeter and you measure from the negative of the battery terminal to the top of the battery and you get voltage, that's an indication that customers overfill the battery. And what you've done is you've pushed sulfate out of the battery and that'll cause a dilution of your, 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 your acid and that will cause battery loss and battery capacity loss. It'll also cause perpetually low uh, specific gravity readings. So when I get a customer who sends me a specific gravity report and they're all 1.220, 1.225, 1.230, 1.250 or 2.220, if they're all low but they're all about the same and he equalizes those batteries and those specific gravities don't rise at all, that tells me that that customer or client's been overfilling their battery because that tells me that the, the electrolyte's been pushed out or the sulfate's been pushed out and you've lost battery capacity because you no longer have a sulfur to make the battery capacity. And so that's a, de that's a, that's a definite problem that a lot of people run into is they, they overfill their batteries uh, quite often. Um, so hopefully that answered your question there, uh, Julian, or Julian. Um, uh, I got another question. Uh, what do you mean by, de by defeat end amps? Okay, well, first thing you need to understand is what is end amps? Um, end amps is, uh, is a setting, it's, a, it's also called return amps, it's also called tail current. And what, what an end amps is, is when a lead acid battery is charging or a lead based battery is charging, when the current goes below between two and 5%, for one full hour, that battery is no longer accepting much current to charge. So there's no reason to continue to charge it, okay? So when the battery is accepting, when the, when the current going into the battery, say you have a thousand amp hour battery bank and the current going to that thousand amp hour battery bank drops below 20 amps for one full hour, it's no longer accepting any current. Now, the reason that the one full hour timer is on there Let's say you've got another inverter, you got a multiple stack of inverters, or you've got a diversion load, or you've got DC loads connected to the batteries. Those DC loads can draw current out of the battery while you're charging and will affect those end amp settings. And a lot of times, say you've got a Outback FlexNet DC and you've got a Schneider inverter or a Schneider charge controller, it doesn't see the current coming from those devices because those devices don't talk. Schneider doesn't speak Outback. Outback doesn't speak Magnum. Magnum doesn't speak SMA. They don't talk to each other. And so what ends up happening is, is that if you have your end amp set at, you know, say you've got a thousand amp hour battery, you got the end amp set to 20 amps with no timer, 
then what ends up happening is, is it goes on the it goes on the float and thinks the batteries are charged. So the charge controller is doing what you've told it to do. And much like teenagers, if you teach a teenager to mow the lawn wrong the wrong way or to do a task the wrong way, uh, they're going to do that until someone corrects them. They're going to do it incorrectly. And so charge controllers, inverters, if you program them incorrectly, you're never going to get them properly set up. And so Whenever you have a sulfated battery, whenever you're troubleshooting a battery bank in general, you should always defeat end amps. And the reason for that is, is that, and what means, it means disable your end amp settings. So if you have an outback charge controller, you set the end amps to zero. If you have a Schneider inverter or a Schneider charge controller, end amps is determined based on the battery capacity. So you lower the battery capacity down to 100 or 200 amp hours. On a Magnum, the same thing, end amps is determined by the battery capacity setting. So you have to drop that down. If you have a Victron controller or inverter, you can go in and disable it uh, under the advanced programming setup. So the if you have a sulfated battery, what happens is, is that the amount of current going into the battery drops off very, very quickly in the absorption stage. And that's the sulfation causing that because the higher resistance causes voltage, voltage to climb faster and the, the inverter thinks the batteries are fully charged. So Whenever you're doing any kind of setting like that, you've got to disable any air indamps. If you don't, you're never going to recover it because you're never forcing that current or forcing that voltage into the battery. Okay. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, we've got another question. What resting voltage should I see in a 48 volt gel battery bank when 100% charged? Do you have a table for gel batteries for VOC versus resting state of charge. Um, uh, I don't want to murder your name, so but I appreciate the question. Um, it's a good question, but it's also a problematic question. Um, it's one of the one of the issues that 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 uh, that um, perplexes a lot of people. The problem with it, valve regulated batteries or sealed batteries is they are sealed and you can't look at specific gravities to tell what the state of charge is. Um, so you have to look at your, 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 your voltages. The problem with that is, is that you need to look at your resting and your loaded voltages and you preferably need to do that over a period of time with, a, with an amount of load, similar to a load test. Um, I am looking for a chart, so pardon me why I ramble on a little bit. Um, we do put a chart. Uh, we no longer put the chart in the manuals because it just causes more problems with customers. We have this chart. We talk about this chart during our presentations, our PowerPoint presentations, and during our, our technical trainings because that allows us to explain it. And I'm going to put the chart up here. There we go. And it'll take a couple seconds to update. So and so, what this chart says is that any lead acid battery using voltage as an indication of health is the absolute worst thing you can do. Okay, if you have a valve regulated battery or a sealed battery, you should be installing some sort of battery status meter, like the Outback FlexNet DC, the BMK from Nagnum, the BMK from Schneider, uh, Bogart Engineering makes a pentametric, a trimetric. Um, Midnight makes a Whizbang Junior, uh, Morningstar makes a, a meter, Victron makes a meter, everybody makes a meter nowadays. Um, the meters are as good as you program them, so you need to make sure those are properly programmed. And so that will, those count amps out versus amps back in, typically. Uh, they do a few other things, but you'll want to try to avoid using voltage as an indicator of state of charge, because if you have a sulfated battery, the voltages are going to be wrong. And so you need to be cautious with that. So um, typical, uh, oops, sorry about that. Didn't want to back that up. All right, so, so typical using voltage in as an indication of health, okay? A lead acid battery is going to measure 2.13 volts per cell, okay? 2.13 volts per cell, fully charged, rested, open cell. That means with two to three hours of rest. So when you're taking voltage measurements on your battery, 
you need to that you need to do two ways. One, you need to shut your whole system down, put everything in the bypass, and then measure your individual batteries. How many people do you know with an off-grid solar system are going to shut their entire system down and let it rest? Not many people at all. So you want to measure that 2.13 volts per cell at rest. Now you can do it under load as well. And here are some here are some charts or tables under load, but you have to be careful. Is this is at a C10 discharge rate? Okay, this load is at a C10 discharge rate, which means you're discharging at the 10 hour rate. Most customers aren't just going to discharge at the 10 hour rate. They're going to discharge at a 20 hour rate, and so your voltages may be higher. And so um, you can look at your battery voltages. You can you can and and keep track of your battery voltages. But I would not use your battery voltage as an indicator of the state of charge or health of the battery bank. Um, uh, the the you know one of the things I suggest to do on AGM batteries and gel batteries is to do a load test once a year, and that means to charge them up to 100% full, load them up with a C10 discharge rate over a five-hour period, and take measurements over that five-hour period to make sure your batteries are all holding voltage over a period of time. And so there is a webinar on our YouTube channel how to do this that, descri that describes this uh, this procedure how to do this testing. Um, Again, it's not the it's not the best thing to do. Is I would advise against measuring voltages to see what the state of charge in the battery bank is. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, another question: How many battery arrays can we have in parallel? In parallel in one converter, so that we do not have problems with currents. Um, if you don't want to have problems with currents one series string of batteries period uh, most installers today uh, won't even touch battery banks that have got over two parallel strings of batteries um, and the reason for that is is that you're going to have probably anything over two parallel strings you're going to have currents we recommend at rolls that you do no more than three parallel strings of batteries ever matter of fact in the manual it says if you've got more than three parallel strings you are not going to get your batteries warranted for capacity because they are going to lose capacity because when you have multiple parallel strings, you will eventually see capacity problems. So um, how to offset that? Uh, if I've got, you know, basically what you do is you you drop your, instead of using six parallel strings of uh, S6L16HCs, which would be six parallel strings would be um a 2600 amp hour battery bank you design the battery bank with two parallel strings of 1300 amp hour cells so you use the the s2 l16 sc and you would use two parallel strings of those or you would use the series 5000 batteries and run a higher capacity battery um, if you're stuck and you have to do multiple parallel strings in some cases, customers do do multiple parallel strings uh, because they would rather deal with the 120 pound batteries instead of 400 or 300 pound batteries. Um, if you do do that, um, you, that increases your maintenance. Uh, one, it increases your overall cell maintenance. Two, you also need to go in and do maintenance on your battery bank. Uh, you separate your parallel strings and charge your parallel strings individually. Um, so if you separate your parallel strings, uh, if you set your separate your parallel strings, you're gonna, uh, you know, you and separate your parallel strings and charge those parallel strings individually, and then put everything back together every six months or so. Um, that battery is gonna have a longer, healthier life. Um, we have a follow-up question on the. Uh, let's see here. Oh, a follow-up question for the, the parallel strings. Uh, I have, I mean the equalization currents. Um, you're not gonna be able to control equalization currents. Um, it, I mean, it, especially if you're equalizing multiple parallel strings of batteries, you're not gonna be able to control that. So the best way to do that is when you are equalizing, separate the parallel strings, you know, so instead of, you know, two parallel strings, separate it to one series string each, char, equalize one series string, shut it off, equalize the other series string, and then put them back together again. Um, you can't control current going into the battery in the absorption or the equalization stage. I mean, ideally, you've done a full bulk absorption charge 
before you do an equalization because you don't want a lot of extra current in equalization uh, because the batteries are already getting hot and hot, hot and hot and hot or hotter than you really want. Um, for the follow-up on the end amp setting uh, question, uh, thanks for this. I have a Schneider BMK installed, but it wanted to make sure that it was at 100% before syncing to the BMK to the bank. The battery is 24, uh, 24 gel S two six nineties have been sitting at the job for five months. Well, the good news is you have that's a valve regulated battery, so sitting at a job site for five months without a charge isn't a huge thing. Um, it doesn't help them, but it isn't an absolutely huge thing because they don't discharge as fast as flooded. So, but what you want to how you do this is it's a Schneider BMK. Um, you install a system, you charge it up to what you think is full. So you, you, what I would do is I would cycle it. I would charge it up to, to I would watch the current going into the battery. Okay. So if they're 24 S2 690s, I would charge the batteries up until the current dropped below 10 amps for an hour. Look at the current, put your current meter on there and measure it. When the DC current going into the batteries drops below 10 amps or 12 amps for an hour, they're not accepting any more current. And then I would do a real quick, you know, I would load up the battery bank and discharge at about 100 to 200 amps of, or about 100 amps, about 10, 15%, and then charge it again. And then I would cycle that, I would, I would repeat that about four or five times as I'm commissioning the battery bank. And then once, once I've charged it back up to full that, that six or seventh or eighth time, then all you got to do is you re you power down the Schneider inverter and you power it back up and that'll set it at 100% because you're assuming 100% at that point. Okay, because it, it when it powers up, it assumes 100%. So that's how you would do that. Um, can you repeat the voltage measurement sentence? Uh, Mark, can you, uh, can you evaluate, can you expand on that some more? Are you talking about uh, uh, to measuring voltages? Um, the voltages, and so basically what you, I mean, I'll mumble on here a little bit as we go, but remember using voltage is indicated to health. So if I've got an, uh, if I've got a, a S6 460 AGM battery, I'm gonna, that battery fully charged and resting for two to three hours, okay, should measure, 0.13 volts per cell or oops or six it should measure 6.39 volts okay it should measure above 6.39 volts and so and so if you're if you're if you're if and so if I if I charge the battery and then I let it sit open cell for two to three hours, I should still have a voltage above this. If I have that, I'm gonna consider the batteries good, okay? Now let's say, let's say I, I do this and it's measuring 6.2 volts, okay? So it's a little lower, 6.2 is um, uh, roughly about 2.06 volts per cell, 2.06 volts per cell, okay? So if I do that, my battery ballpark is probably closer to about 80%, probably 80 to 85% state of charge with that voltage, okay? And again, this is all with absolutely no load attached to the battery. And it has to be sitting and resting for two or three hours. If you don't do that, if you're measuring those voltages while even the inverter is connected, even if the inverter is turned off, if the inverter is connected and powered up, it's going to be drawing a little bit of power and it's going to be affecting these volt, volt measurements. And so measuring voltage is the absolute worst way you can check. The abs measuring voltage is the absolute worst way that you can check state of charge in a battery. Okay. So you mentioned something about checking voltage uh, on the between the negative and the top of the battery. Didn't quite catch that. Okay, so um, so let me pop off to another screen here. Let's see if I can get a picture of the top of the battery. So let's say 
let's say this is the top of the battery, okay? Um, ignore the electrolyte. First of all, you don't ever want electrolyte to look like this. That is bad, okay? That battery has been cooked literally to death, okay? But if I were to take my positive voltmeter and connect my positive connection, connect my positive connection over to here, oops. Then here we go. All right, so I take my positive voltmeter and it's not letting me draw on it. So if I take my positive voltmeter and I connect my, my, my positive lead here, and I put my negative lead, say, right here, okay? It's got to populate. It's uh, taking a bit, as a matter of fact. There we go, okay. Yeah, it's a little slow, unfortunately. Internet's, uh, these days, as we all know, we're all, uh, <laughs> we're all stuck at home. So everybody's at home uh, surfing the internet. So if I take my positive lead and I connect my positive lead to my positive post here, okay? And I take my negative lead and I just put it right here on the top of the battery, okay? And so I'm measuring positive or I'm measuring negative positive and I get my voltmeter, okay? And that voltmeter is telling me that there's 0.2 volts here, okay? There shouldn't be any voltage there. And the only reason that there's voltage there is because there's, there's been electrolyte spillage on the top of the battery. And so whenever you go to a battery site, whenever I go to a battery site, I'll take my voltmeter and I'll measure this, especially if I see the tops of batteries, if they look a little uh, dark, um, if they look a little dark, uh, that will tell me that there's definitely been spillage on the battery in the past. Um, and again, when customers overfill batteries, what ends up happening is, is you end up getting spillage. Like for example, it'll probably take a second for this picture to load because it's a pretty significantly sized picture. Um, you know, this one's got spillage all over the place. And so it's, it's coming, it's coming slowly. Um, just be patient. There we go. It should be up now 86%. There we go. So it should be loaded by now. Yeah, even with the uh, Series 5000 batteries, <laughs> um, if you get voltage measurement on the top of the battery without connecting it to a piece of metal, you've got problems. You definitely have issues. So um, like, for example, this battery bank here, not only have they mixed all different types of batteries, um, but if you took a volt measurement, you took your positive lead and you connected your positive lead to here, Oops. And we connected our positive lead. If we connected our positive lead to here, and then we connected our negative lead and touched our negative lead right to here, we would get voltage. And that voltage is detrimental to the system. All right, so um, another question. Um, when I checked the specification sheet, example, the 2KS33P, I did not see the three voltage charge level bulk absorption float. Where can I have this information? Um, that information is on our user manual, okay? And so the user manual has all that information. Uh, it's not in the spec sheets because we don't wanna change spec sheets every single time that we change uh, that we change a, 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 a charging spec because um, the charging specs do change from period from time to time. Uh, let me see if I can find. As I'll address a couple things with that as well. Um, be sure that when you are setting charging parameters. Okay, that you're using the correct charging parameter. And that's gonna load, it's gonna take a few minutes to load here, a few seconds to load here. I'm, I apologize for the slow connection. I'm even on a wired connection and it's acting slow today. Um, so this is our charging chart for flooded lead acid batteries, okay? And so you wanna be careful with this. Please note this right here, and it's not going for me again. Please note, 
this right here. Note, use a highlighted, use the highlighted voltage. <laughs> excuse me. Use the highlighted voltage when the equipment is supplied with a battery temp sensor. Set at five millivolts per degree C per cell. So it's 120 millivolts for a 48 volt system per degree Celsius from a 25 degree C delta. Okay. So what that means is we want to know what the actual battery temperature is, not the ambient temperature of the battery bank. Okay. So if you're in BC and your ambient temperature is 18 degrees Celsius, and a lot of installers will tell you this. <coughs> oh yeah, you're in BC. <coughs> Excuse me. It only gets to. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm um, talking too much. <clears throat> so you get to 18 degrees C, it only gets to 25 degrees C here, Max. So you don't need a battery temp sensor. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, that is 100% false, okay? So what you do is you install a system with the battery temp sensor and you program the system. And there's two charts there's this chart. <clears throat> and the next chart, which is for lightly you lightly yellow loaded systems. Oh, pardon me. <clears throat> so this is the second chart for lightly loaded systems. Okay. So for flooded lead acid batteries, for the flooded batteries, your your bulk absorption voltage, bulk and absorption, should be between 2.45 and 2.5 volts per cell okay at 25 degrees c so if you're using a battery temp sensor you must you you must be you must be setting your settings here because if you use a battery temp sensor and you go oh, my 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 max temperature is, is 30 degrees c so i'm going to use this chart the problem with that is is if you use that chart what will happen is is that you won't get a proper charge out of those battery out of those out of those out of the batteries and that's going to cause all kinds of problems because you're you're doing what they call double temperature compensating not only are you temperature compensating on this number but you're temp compensating off of this number the 2.5 volts per cell so what happens is is that instead of charging at 2.48 now it's charging at 2.46 and now you're not getting a full 100% charge, okay? <clears throat> so we would prefer that you use temp, temp sensors. And of course, these charts are all in the manuals. This is the flooded lead acid. Uh, the next chart uh, is for flooded lead acid for, 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 you know, say cabin or cottage use where some, there's not someone on site using a lot of power. You can use a lower voltage. Uh, these are the charts for the AGM batteries. Let me clear this writing off. Uh, these are the charts for the AGM batteries, and then these are charts for the gels. Okay. So, and so you've got to follow those charts. If you don't follow those charts, you're going to have problems. Um, let's see here. What is the threshold to indicate a problem during that test? Um, I'm assuming that you're looking at load test. Uh, I'm looking at my looking at my voltages for my cells um, on a two volt battery. I don't want more than a, than a four tenths of a volt difference between cells. On a six volt battery, it's eight tenths. On a 12 volt battery, it's it, it's uh, I don't want a volt 1.2 volts difference between cells. Any more than that, then you're going to have problems. Oh, test between positive post and battery top. That just means I don't want any voltage there. There should be zero volts. If you measure from the negative to the to the top or the positive to the top and you get any voltage whatsoever, that means you have someone has spilled electrolyte and there's still electrolyte on the top of that battery. And so that that needs to be cleaned off. I mean, it's not dangerous, but it just tells you that someone's been overfilling. Um uh do the new higher charging voltages apply to old install battery banks as well i.e someone has 10 year old battery bank um yes and no i would probably go halfway in between it just depends on their current battery performance if there's specific gravities that's all based on specific gravities if the specific gravities are all good 
leave it alone. If the specific gravities are bad or low or they're struggling to get their specific gravities up into the that 1260 to 1275 range, um, then then you might want to slowly bump up your voltages. Uh, a 10 year old battery bank, uh, a 10 year old battery bank, I would put, uh, you know, I would I would work it up slowly and I'd be happy with 1255 to 1265 with a little bit lower specific gravity. All right, lots of good questions so far, everybody. Appreciate it. This is what I like to call uh, stump the stump the chump. So, if you guys have any other questions, um, I will go ahead and talk about something else. Why another question comes up? Hopefully, I've answered everybody's questions. Ah, talk about Nam. Okay, so. NAM is basically our name for car a carbon additive to the battery, okay? So what that is, is that's our name for it. Um, and so it's, it's just basically a, an activated carbon on the battery. And so in, in, uh, in 2019, we added NAM to all of our 4,500 and 5,000 series batteries. Um, Eventually, we're probably going to add NAM to our Series 4000 batteries, um, but the NAM is basically just a carbon added up to the to the negative post, the, the negative plate. And what that does is it helps prevent some sulfation, so it helps it helps keep the sulfation from from, from attaching hard or or solidifying to the negative plate, which allows for the sulfation to be pushed back off when you when you charge the batteries. Um, it also increases the overall charge acceptance of the battery so it should speed up the 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 actual charge time of the battery bank as well um the one problem with nam is it does speed up it does speed up the self discharge of the battery so if you're in africa and you are uh ordering batteries and you get a container of batteries and the container spent two or three weeks on the ocean or two or three months on the ocean by the time you get them, you may have to you may have to jumpstart them like a car battery, uh, or if the customer at the dealer distributorship had the batteries in stock for more than you know four or five months, um, you're going to have to jumpstart those batteries to get the voltage to come up. That's not going to hurt the batteries because they the the NAM should prevent that solvation from staying on the plates, but it's an inconvenience when it comes when you have to jump it like a dead dead car battery to get the battery to turn on again. So um that's what nam does it helps and it's uh i would expect uh eventually once we get enough nam we're eventually going to put it in all of our flooded lead acid batteries which is going to overall expand the the life and health of the batteries um what is the black gunk in flooded lead acid batteries sometimes when you see checking specific gravity readings um that black gunk it's off it's often it's black and it, it can be black. Usually it's gray when it starts out. It turns black due to heat. Um, basically what that is, is it's perfectly natural. Uh, there's a couple things that cause it. One, you're gonna, it doesn't matter which Rolls battery you, you, you have, even today, you're gonna find them in brand new batteries. Um, when you get the, each positive plate is enveloped in its own enveloping material. And that positive plate has a, uh, envelope that's got this uh, fiberglass like material inside the battery and when when they when they when they uh, when you when you charge the battery the temperature rise up and that causes some of that excess material to come off and that comes out like a stringy gray blackish gunk almost looks like uh, sticky hairs inside the battery um, it's perfectly natural with the battery. It's a, it, it is a hassle, and I understand that because I've dealt with it for many years before I even started working for Rolls. Um, it's just the way that it's just a manufacturing side effect of the battery. Some batteries have it, some batteries don't. And actually, most all batteries do when you tear them apart. The, the stuff's down usually at the bottom of the battery. It's just floating around. So it's not going to, that black gunk is not going to affect the life of the batteries. It just makes taking specific gravity me measurements a little more difficult. Uh, from time to time. Uh, a follow-up on the 
on the NAM again. I recall reading something about when the NAM batteries reach something like 2.41 volts per cell, they're 90% full. I found this not to be the case. I think this is from the first webinar that you put out on them. Um, yeah, 2.41 is a little low. I don't think I ever said that. Um, when they, when you finish, when you get to the 2.5, 2.45 to 2.5, your state of charge is a little higher, yes. And so instead of being 80%, yes, they are, when you get to that absorption time period, they are about 90% full, but it's not 2.41, it's 2.45 to 2.5. Um, maybe we were having the lower charging settings then, but uh, um, uh, your absorption, your, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, Mark. I, I got memory failures all the time. Um, but anyways, <laughs> um, I'll have to go back and check those old webinars to see if they, uh, if it actually does say that, because who knows, maybe I said that and maybe it was some bad information, but two point, typically when you get to the absorption voltage on a non NAM battery, you're only about 80% state of charge. On a NAM battery, you're about 90% state of charge, but you don't want to, what, how, what you want to do is you program your absorption time just like you would with a non-NAM ba non battery, and then you adjust down for absorption time. So let's say you program your absorption time to four hours. So you set it to four hours, brand new installation. <clears throat> you check your specific gravities. When your specific gravities, say they're the specific gravities you're getting into the 1270s, low 1280s, maybe high 1280s. Then what I would do is I would set my absorption time down to three hours, okay? Give it a couple of weeks. When those 1280s drop down into the 1270s and the 1270s turn into the 1260s, leave it alone, okay? Um, don't touch it. That's where you want your setting. If you dropped it down to two hours and, the, and they drop down, say you, drop, say you dropped out an hour and they drop down to 1255, 1260, well, you want them a little higher than that, so I would add a half hour back into it. So, um, and that's how you figure out what your absorption timer should be. And those absorption timers are going to change a couple times a year, depending on the amount of solar production that you're actually getting. So, um, so be cautious with that. So, <laughs> the NAM's a a good answer for sulfation issues, uh, but it doesn't make your it doesn't make it like a lithium battery where when a lithium battery hits the absorption time or the absorption voltage, it's really about 95% state of charge. Um, so um, unfortunately, it, it still needs, to, they, they, there still needs to be an acceptance phase there. How the heck do we, <laughs> how the heck do we teach customers to change absorbed volts? Yeah, that's pretty good. I'll get to the, the question I just skipped. Um, that's the hard part is with a lot of these customers, you, 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 you know, you, it's, it can be difficult at times to, to, to educate them and, you know, and, and, and get them to do what they should be doing, you know, and the best way to explain it to the, as you said, the, the off grid rednecks, best way to explain it is when you buy a car and you, you go out and you buy that Chevy and that Chevy Silverado, and they put it in the driveway, and they put, you know, 5, 10, 12,000 miles on it, and they don't change the oil, the manufacturer is not going to cover the, 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 if you're not showing that you're doing your oil changes, Chevrolet is not going to take care of that, that vehicle under warranty when the engine seizes up, okay? If they drive it for 70,000 miles and never change the oil, that's a problem. And so the same thing with batteries. If you, you should be looking, your customers should be looking at those specific gravities at least quarterly, and and twice a year, you're going to see differences in settings. I mean, if you use the same winter settings for summertime, you're going to be overcharging your batteries and cooking them. If you use, you know, and then the same thing with the summer. If you use summer settings in the winter time, you're not going to be charging them well enough because you get more power in the sun. So it's all about you got to educate that client. <clears throat> and the way I used to do it is, you know, when I did an installation in Southern California. You know, you get to know your customer. You bring out a, you know, a twenty-dollar bottle of wine, a six-pack of beer, or, you know, a, 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 you bring out coffee or tea or whatever, and you sit down with them over the kitchen table, both him and the wife, and you walk them through this stuff. You take them in front of the inverters and you show them where the disconnect switches are, 
You show them where the breakers are. You show them how to get into the, you show them, you, you teach them how to get into the menus and you explain to them, you are your own power company. You are, you, you, you know, it's now, it's now, you, this is now John Doe Power Company. And on a Saturday afternoon or a Sunday afternoon, if something happens, I'm not answering my phone. You need to be, you, I need to educate you well enough to be able to take care of your own system so that you can take care of the 80% of the problems, 80% of the issues that come up, because there will be issues. And then you can call me and I'll take care of the other 20%. And it does take more, it does take more time as an installer to do that. But when you do that, your customers will be happier, they'll be educated, they will, they will be happier about the installation, they will be happier with you, and then they will refer you to other, to, to other customers that you can do work for them. I haven't installed a system since 2005, and I have about 250 off-grid installations in Southern California in the high desert area, Victorville, Apple Valley, up and up on the 395 North into that area. And, and I, to this day, I still get, because I still have the same phone number I had then, I still get calls from people wanting me to install systems in that area uh, or wanting me to go out and troubleshoot systems in that area um, because my customers will always say, yeah, I know this guy, he's up in Washington now, but he was, he's been great with my system. Um, so, and that's, that's how you get that, that secondary, that secondary market, um, that secondary market of, you know, of, of working with your customers and clients and training your customers and clients. So, um, so yeah, uh, I did do a three part series on determining charge settings. I'm not going to go through all that today. We don't have a whole lot of extra time. But if you go to our YouTube channel, if you go to, to YouTube, you type in Rolls Battery Engineering Channel. Uh, I think there's 28 videos on there, about 30 hours of content. Um, if you are NABCEP certified, there is a playlist that's specifically for NABCEP certified. When you finish those, uh, you send it, send me an email at steve at Uh You tell me which one you did, I send you the test. You take the test. If you get 70% on the test, I'll send you a certificate for NAPSEP certification. Um, <clears throat> so if you're doing your NAPSEP CEUs, you can take care of that. Um, all right. So can oldish flooded lead acid batteries show high specific gravity, thus 1265, 1275, but still be a, so still be so sulfated that it is next to done? Um, yes. Now, as batteries age, generally the most common thing that happens to them, especially when they're being uh, grossly undercharged, is you start to see the specific gravities fall, okay? Um, so the specific gravities will fall over a period of time. Um, now, normally what happens on a flooded lead acid battery that isn't properly sulfated, what you'll actually start to see is you'll actually start to see those specific gravities go up. And what that what causes that is that as the battery ages, you lose more and more plate material. That plate material is oxide. Inside that oxide is the sulfation. And so what ends up happening is it ends up cooking the oxide off the plates, and that sulfation goes back into the electrolyte. So you might actually see the specific gravities go higher and higher and higher. Um, so yes, you can see that. Um, Typically, when when I call a, a call the end of life on a flooded lead acid battery, I would say 95% of the time it's because you just can't get the specific gravities back up. Um, there's probably another 5% of the time where you start seeing specific gravities just running away. You know, 12, 90, 1300, 1320, 1400 as high. I've seen them as high as 1400. Um, that's usually an indica indication that you're actually losing plate material, and that's usually due to heat. Um, you know, you know, it's that's usually due to heat, and that plate material is coming off into the electrolyte. You know, but you'll also see, um, you'll also see the electrolyte will look, um, the electrolyte will look like uh, coffee or um, there's a hydrometer picture I'm looking for. You'll actually see black specks and stuff coming off into the uh, into the hydrometer, which which the hydrometer water, which isn't good. Um, it's probably going to take me too long to find that, but uh, um, 
it's in here somewhere um anyways yeah you you, you want to try to avoid that um so you you want to definitely avoid that um this is our second one of these <laughs> if you guys like this stuff um send me an email let me know um i'm we're trying to do we're, we're, i think we're going to do one of these open session ones every couple of weeks throughout this covid 19 situation um i hope everybody's doing okay I uh, hope your family's all good, and I hope everybody is uh, recovering from this. And I hope, uh, hopefully, we can get this thing behind us. Uh, unfortunately, hope hopefully we can get it behind us soon. But I don't think it's. I think it's going to be with us for the next twelve to eighteen months. Honestly. Um, uh, on that note, it's uh, it's been an hour and one minute. Um, I don't like to. I don't like to make these things too much longer. Um, if you want these presentations, Shane, if you want this this information, let me back up here and uh, oops. Um, we I have all this stuff, including my full 700 slide presentation in PDF form on um, a Google Drive. Let me share the link for you. Uh, you can send me an email and I will send you the link. Or if you just type this link in, Give it a second for it to populate. Uh, let's see, get it back up. Come on. Love it when the internet's not moving very fast. Okay, here we go. So here's the link. If you go to http colon forward slash forward slash tiny dot cc forward slash roles shared drive, that'll take you right into the um, Google Drive. If you click on presentations, uh, let me see if that'll work here. If you click on presentations, that will bring you into the that will bring you into it and uh, the, the the entire Google Drive. Let's see if this is populating. There we go. So there's the uh, external shared. So uh, archive documents, battery spec sheet, certifications, design tools, field load testing, uh, floor picks. If you're interested in looking at floor picks. Uh, gassing calculations, but if you scroll down, come on, you scroll down and you look at uh, the, if you look at the PowerPoints, there we go, PowerPoints, and so here's the entire 2020 slide deck, uh, all PDF, it's over 700 slides. It doesn't have any audio information or any notes. And then here are uh, different uh, presentations uh, that we've done over the past. Uh, some of these have audio recordings. Like if you look at uh, uh, 2018 Montego Bay, this was done in Jamaica. Uh, this also has audio recordings of the actual training along with the PowerPoint. So if you want to follow it around, you're good to go. Um, anyways, I want to... <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. I'm going to check to make sure we don't have any other questions. Uh, let's see here. Make sure we don't have any other questions before I cut this off. If you have any, if uh, if you get to the end of the day and if you have another question, feel free to send me send me an email. Uh, my email address is uh, Steve at Surrett.com, uh, and I'll go ahead and send it to you. Shane, I'll go ahead and email it to you directly as well. All right. Uh, thank you. You guys have a good day. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming.